Galatians chapter 5, reading from verse 24 through 26 tonight. Last week we had uh, spoke on meekness and temperance, uh, two of the fruit of the Spirit. This evening we're just going to finish up the chapter. This is kind of a summary uh, of the Spirit's work and the Christian life. And we also have a warning uh, as we come to verse uh, 26. We're going to title this tonight, The Crucified Life. He says here, reading in verse 24, And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. Now, Heavenly Father, again tonight we ask your, for Your blessings and Your anointing upon the reading of Thy Holy Scripture. Lord, we ask again that You speak to our hearts as we work our way through this book and now that we're finishing this chapter. Lord, we pray that we'll make application to these passages. We'll apply them to our Christian life. Lord, we ask all of these things in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Again, these verses bring us to the end and close of this chapter. We have spent about eight weeks looking at the works of the flesh in verses 19 through 21 and the fruit of the Spirit in verses 22 and 23. I hope this has been a blessing and rewarding to you as it has to me. You have to listen to it for about an hour each time. I've spent seven, eight hours uh, on it. And so you're really gleaning from it when you spend that much time searching the words and the Scripture and what God has to say in other places. Notice as we begin here in verse 24, the first thing I want to point out in verse 24 is that it makes reference to those that are Christ. And then secondly, he speaks of those who are Christ that they have done something. They have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. First of all, notice with me that they that are Christ. This is a statement just simply saying belonging to Christ. In other words, those who are saved. We find that as we've read through this book, we found that in verse 26 of chapter 3, that he says, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. And then he says in verse 29 of that chapter, And if you be Christ, notice the expression there, those that are Christ, if you be Christ, in other words, belonging to Christ, he said, If you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What we're talking about here, again, they that are Christ, those who belong to Him, those who are born again. The Bible tells us in many places, speaks of those who are in Christ. I'm going to be reading in 1 Corinthians 15, um, and, and then I'm going to be reading in 2 Corinthians 10. 1 Corinthians 15, we have uh, in verse 22 and 23, I think really sums up who those in Christ are. Being in Christ defines our position as believers, as we stand before God. And as God saw us in Adam, He now sees us in Christ, those who are saved. And as we consider this, as He now sees us in Christ, that means we share all that Christ is and all that Christ has accomplished. Just like when we were in Adam, we share with Adam all that he was and all that he accomplished. Notice in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 22 and verse 23. He clearly defines two groups of people. Verse 22, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. So we see here two groups of people, those now he's speaking in spiritual terms, those who are in Adam. We're all descendants of Adam. We were in Adam before we were saved. 
Then he mentions those that are in Christ, that they shall be made alive. But notice verse 23. He says, but every man, now speaking now of resurrection, he said, but every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are, what's the next expression? Christ, those belonging to Christ at His coming. So Christ was raised first. He is the first fruits of a great harvest that will come later. And then He says, and they that are Christ at His coming. Those who belong to Christ. Another time that we see this is in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. We see it many times, but I'm just using these two to show what it means to belong to to uh, be Christ, to belong to Him, to be in Christ, and He says here in Second Corinthians ten, verse seven, He says here, "Do you look on things after the outward appearance? If any man trust to himself that he is Christ, here's that expression again. Let him of himself think this again." that as He is Christ, even so are we Christ. Apostles, they were of Christ. The Corinthians that were saved, they were of Christ, that is, belonging to Him. Now go back with me to Galatians and notice now the remaining of the verse. Tremendous verse. He says here in verse 24, And they that are Christ, that is, born again, belonging to Christ, and they that are Christ, notice, have something that has happened in their life. They have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. So they have dealt with the works of the flesh. They have dealt with the old, the product of the old nature. Now, Here's my definition of this passage when he says they have crucified the flesh. In other words, I believe this means that at conversion, every believer crucified the flesh in that they repented and renounced the life of sin. That doesn't mean they haven't sinned or failed since then. But let me say this again. And this is so important because what we're reading here, have crucified the flesh, is the opposite of the works of the uh, flesh and is a choice that someone makes and it is the mark of true Christianity because those that are lost are marked as those who walk according to the flesh. Those who are saved have been identified or have the mark of those who have crucified the flesh. Just the opposite. That means that we do everything perfect? No. But that means that we stepped on that straight and narrow path the moment we were converted. We made a conscious decision. So let me say this again. I actually wrote this down so I would not forget it. And I'm not saying this is original to me. I I don't even know where... Uh, I got this, or did I get it somewhere? I don't even know, but I wrote this down in my Bible with this verse so I would never forget it. And here's that definition again. At conversion, every believer crucified the flesh in that they repented and renounced the life of sin. Is that not true? Is that not true? When we were born again, when we came into the faith, There was a repentance involved. See, this is what I'm getting at here. When it says they have crucified the flesh, there was a conscious decision that they would renounce sin and a life of sin and that there was repentance. Now, let me give you an idea here because the nature of saving faith includes repentance. Are you with me tonight? And you've heard me deal with this many times. But let me just take you to one book, and I want you to notice how many times that the issue of repentance is there. Why is this important? Because so many today deny the doctrine of repentance. Turn with me to Acts chapter 20. I'm just going to take you on a tour through the book of Acts, and that's all we'll do is look at that as far as repentance. And 
And I'm going to start in chapter 20 and then back up to chapter 2. A lot of people deny repentance or they redefine repentance. We know that repentance is a godly sorrow over sin. It is a change of mind that results in a change of life and direction. It is a turning to God from sin and the works of the flesh. And many, they hate this doctrine. They'll either say it doesn't exist today as far as getting saved, or they'll say that uh, they're going to change the definition of it. They're going to redefine this word. Again, repentance is a godly sorrow over sin, a change of mind resulting in a change of life and direction. I've heard people say, preachers say, we don't have to repent of your sins. Sin is the whole issue. Sin is what placed our Savior on the cross. It's what places individuals in hell. Sin is the issue. For by one man, sin entered into the world. We all became sinners because of one man that we're descended of, and that's Adam. That's why I said, in Adam all die. In Christ shall all be made alive. And so the issue of repentance, again, the nature of saving faith includes repentance. Acts chapter 20 and verse 21. We find here in this passage, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. In this same chapter, the Apostle Paul in verse 24 the latter part of that verse, he mentions here about his ministry, how he received of the Lord and to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And then in verse 25, he mentions the kingdom of God by which we enter into. And it's through repentance and faith. Notice in Acts chapter 2. Let's just go through a few verses here. I'm just doing this as a reminder because this is what it means that they that are Christ have crucified the flesh. They have repented of sin. They have put their faith in Jesus Christ. They have renounced their former life and have began on the straight and narrow path. We find here in Acts chapter 2, this is uh, the first sermon uh, after Christ ascended into, into heaven at Pentecost, Acts 2.38. He says, Then Peter said unto them, Repent. Now they had asked him, what should we do after the preaching of Christ? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The word baptism doesn't scare me there. I don't have to uh, finagle around with it. Those who accept Christ as their Savior follow the Lord in believers' baptism. And we know that baptism doesn't go before the new birth. In Acts chapter 10, Peter, the same preacher, preaches to Cornelius, and they believe and they receive the Spirit, and then Peter takes them and baptizes them. Notice with me in Acts chapter 3. In Acts chapter 3, we're reading from verse 19. He said in verse 19, he said, Repent you therefore and be converted. Notice that. And he goes on to say that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Notice with me as we come to Acts chapter 5. We find in Acts chapter 5 verse 30 and 31. He said in verse 30 and 31, Him hath God exalted with Him at the right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. I don't need to read any Father, Notice Jesus Christ was given as a prince and a savior and to give repentance to Israel. That's who they're preaching to at this time is to that nation beginning in Jerusalem and Judea. Notice with me in Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11 is a recap of Acts chapter 10 where Cornelius and his household is saved. And we find here in Acts chapter 11, I'm reading in verse 19, and it says here in this passage, verse well, verse 18, it says, When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. What does that mean? Repentance unto salvation or eternal life. Peter goes and tells the Jews that, 
after being with Cornelius, they confront him and ask him why he was among the Gentiles. And he gives them the story. And he said, he, verse 14, uh, he says here, Who shall tell thee words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved? That's Cornelius. And then in verse 19, he tells them that they are saved by the grace of God and receive repentance unto life. Notice again in Acts chapter 17. In Acts chapter 17, verse 30 and 31, we find here Paul is on Mars Hill this time preaching to Gentiles and, and idol worshipers. And he says in verse 30, and, and the time of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom you have ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he raised him from the dead. So, uh, so as they stand before the Jews, they preach repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. As they stood before the Gentiles, the idolaters at Mars Hill, what are the preaching? The same thing. Repentance unto life, that is repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. One other time, notice with me in Acts chapter 26. And if you're taking notes, write down Acts 19.4. Those are the times that the word repentance is used in the book of life. So, in the, in the book of Acts, rather. And so, we flee to the Savior with a sincere sorrow of heart over our sins. That's how we get saved with a sincere sorrow of heart over our sins. That's true repentance. And again, that's downplayed, forgotten, pushed aside many times in our society and even in the churches across our land. We find here that uh, in Acts chapter 26, the Apostle Paul has given his testimony. He speaks of his ministry and how the Lord appeared to him in verse 15 and 16. And then in verse 17 through uh, we'll say about verse 20, we'll read. He said in verse 17, Delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee. Here's what Paul was sent to preach and to do. To open their eyes and to turn, that's the concept of repentance, to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Whereupon, rather, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. Now, here's the verse I really want. He said in verse 20, he said in verse 20, he said, But show first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea, and then to the Gentiles. So here's what Paul is preaching now. And he said that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. So very clear that repentance is a biblical doctrine. Coming back to Galatians 5, verse 24, he says, And they that are Christ, they who are saved, belonging to the Lord, he says, have crucified, past tense. In other words, the moment we were saved, we made a conscious decision that we will, uh, that we will renounce a life of sin he said they have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. Now, there's many other passages we see where this is true. Notice in Galatians chapter 6. In Galatians chapter 6, we find that in verse 14, notice here, the Apostle Paul writing again, he said, But God forbid that I should glory, save, and I accept, in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now watch this. By whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. There's that separation and break from Paul as a believer and the world. Uh, he says that the world is crucified unto him and he unto the world. Notice another time in, in Galatians 2. We got an entire message on this. Verse 20. In verse 20, he says here in verse 20, he says, I am crucified with Christ. An amazing statement. We spent a an whole sermon on verse 20 and 21 when we were coming through this chapter. An amazing chapter. Judicially speaking, the Apostle Paul says, I am, not literally, but I am crucified with 
Christ. Symbolically, He died when Christ died. He was crucified when Christ was crucified. In other words, this emphasizes the union with Christ in His death on the cross, which frees us, according to Romans 6, from the penalty of sin. Now notice this. You see, what He's saying, we can say, I am identified with His death, burial, resurrection, and even His ascension. The word, the the thought here to be crucified. You know, Romans says we've been baptized, spiritually speaking in Romans 6. It's to be identified. This is why in Ephesians 1, 3 it says that we have been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. And he starts mentioning forgiveness, adoption, predestination, uh, redemption, and many other things. So when we become a Christian, we become identified with his death. That death is put to our account. We become identified. We're not only identified with his death, but his burial and his resurrection and his ascension. Let me give you these verses to write down before I read the rest of this verse. Galatians 2.20. Here where we're at, crucified with Christ. In Colossians 2.12, buried with Him. In Colossians 3.1, risen with Him. I'm going through it in order. In Ephesians 2.5, alive with Him. We've been quickened. We're made alive with Him. And then in Ephesians 2.6, guess what? We're seated with Him at the right hand of the Father. We're talking about that this morning in conversation we have not physically seated with Him, not physically crucified, not physically buried, but symbolically, this is put to our account. We have been identified, you know, with Him, sort of like Second Corinthians five twenty one. For He made Him to be sin who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. He, uh, let me put it like this: Our sins were imputed to him, put to his account, and his righteousness has been put to our account. So his death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and even we're seated with him, all of that has been put to the account. That's why we can go to bed at night and know that if we passed in our sleep, that we're secure. We don't have to stay awake and worry about whether we're going to hell or not because we've been born again, we've been saved by the grace of God. And that's a great peace. None of us wants to die. None of us especially, uh, you know, wants to pass in a sleep not knowing that, uh, you know, it passed until it happens. But the thing about it is, is that we can lay down and rest peacefully because we know that these things are true. I am identified with His death, burial, and resurrection and ascension. And even His seating. And then when He shall appear in Colossians 3, when He shall appear, we shall appear with Him in glory. So we have that closeness and identity. That's why He says, and them that are Christ, those who belong to Him, those who are born again. He says here in verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. In other words, Paul is saying, I'm dead. Nevertheless, I live. He said, but I'm alive. Figure that out. You can't figure it out unless you... Look at it from a spiritual point of view. He said, Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave Himself for me. Now let me carry to Romans 6 and and just bring this home. Notice in Romans chapter 6. In Romans 6, beginning in verse 1, I'm going to read several verses in this chapter. Here's our identification with Jesus Christ. And since we're identified with Him, we are to consider ourselves dead to sin and alive unto God. See, here's another thing. When we talk about, I know you hear me say this a lot, and and ain't going to hurt you for me to repeat this over and over again. There's two groups of people, in Adam all die, and Christ shall all be made alive. There's two expressions that we find here in Romans uh, we find, I think, in Galatians and in Peter and other places, there's the expressions dead in sins and dead to sins. A difference in day and night. To be in Adam is to be dead in sin. 
To be in Christ is to be dead to sins. Again, it's identifying two groups of people. And Now watch this as we begin reading in verse 1. He says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Now this chapter is going to encourage us to live for God because of what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. Here's his answer. God forbid. How shall we that are, here's the expression, but we ought to underline these and highlight them in your Bible so they'll jump out at you every time you see them. He said, that are dead to sin. See, those who are saved are no longer dead in sin. He said, dead to sin, live any longer therein. Verse 3, Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, this is a spiritual baptism. Notice we're baptized into His death. We have some of the same language I just gave you in some of these other passages. So he says here in verse 4, He said, therefore, we are buried with Him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. In view of all that He's done, here's what we should do. He said in verse 5, For if we have been planted together in the likeness of His death, we shall also be in the likeness of His resurrection. No, knowing this, that our old man, what's the next word, is what? There it is, crucified. With him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. That's the point of this whole chapter. He says in verse 7, For he that is dead is freed from sin. For if you be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. And then he says in verse 11, Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed into sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Again, through this whole chapter, in verse 17 and 18, But God bethink that ye were the servants of sin, that is when we were dead in sin, But ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you, being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. We were made free from the penalty and the power of sin. Verse 20, For when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. Verse 22, But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Amazing statements. Amazing statements. Turn back with me to Galatians. Hold on to Romans and take Romans chapter 8. Go back with me to Galatians chapter 5. This is why that I catch myself more and more slowing down in these passages as we study in in verse-by-verse setting. Because there's so much here that we don't want to miss this. Now, coming back to the subject of repentance in our article we wrote many years ago, uh, I put a few quotes in here. And one one quote um, from another author, he said, We cannot find a better definition of repentance than the one many of us learned at our mother's knee. Repentance is to leave the sin we loved before and to show that we are in earnest grief by doing so no more. Another writer says, and this is John Bunyan here, he said, Will thou leave thy sins and go to heaven, or will thou have thy sins and go to hell? John Milton says, Repentance is the golden key that opens the palace of eternity. The gate of God's kingdom is closed to those who refuse to repent. And then again, another Author Charles Spurgeon, he said, Repentance is a change of mind, but what a change it is. And many would look at this and say, Oh, they're, they're preaching works for salvation. No, they're not. They're showing the true nature of repentance and faith. And even the Noah Webster's American Dictionary, Dictionary of the English Language, 1828, says, Repentance is real penance, sorrow or deep 
contrition for sin as an offense and dishonor to God, a violation of His holy law, and the basis in gratitude toward a being of infinite benevolence, this is accompanied and followed by amendment of life. In other words, any time there's true repentance, there will be a change of life that is the result of that. And that's one way you can tell whether a person has truly been born again or not. When well, Galatians chapter 5, you're holding on to Romans 8. Notice here in uh, Galatians chapter 5, and, if, and I'm going to read a couple of verses in Romans 8, but just make note in Romans 8 verse 14 with what we've just said about being identified with Christ. I'm going to read a, another verse there in, in a, in a, for a different passage here. But verse 24, and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the lust, with the affections rather than lust. Well, now notice with me in verse 25, he said, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Now we already got one passage here that we've looked at in weeks ago, probably about nine or ten weeks ago, where it talks about, uh, walking in the Spirit. But notice there's a statement here made, and it says, if we live in the Spirit. That's like saying, if you're saved. That's like saying, if you have the Spirit of God dwelling in you. If you've been born of the Spirit. Uh, let me take um, Galatians 3 and just write this down. He speaks of receiving the Spirit at conversion. But notice in Romans 8. In Romans 8. Now let's talk about for a few moments if we live in the Spirit. And I want to give you just a few other verses on what we were just talking about, our identification with Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.17, you all know the verse uh, about us being new creatures in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 4.24, we've read this several times in this series uh, about the new man. Uh, Colossians 3, verses 9 and 10, the new man created after the image of God. This has to do with the new birth. And let me just say this. This will sound hard to someone that's lost, but someone that is saved, it will not sound that hard because those who are saved have already crucified the flesh and its affection and lust in that at conversion, as I've already said, at conversion, that they renounced and repented of a life of sin. Listen to these verses. In Matthew 10:38, And he that taketh not up his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. Somebody lost, look at that, and, and would not truly understand it. Matthew 16, 24, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. That's what a Christian did at conversion. They made a decision to believe on Christ. He's the Savior. They will follow Him. Luke 14, 27, And whosoever doeth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Well, the Christian has already made a decision. He's already made a decision and he has crucified the flesh. He's already done that in that, again, he's repented of sin, accept the Savior, and renounced a life of sin. He decided he would travel on that straight and narrow path and not the broad path that leads to destruction, but the one that leads to eternal life. Now let's talk for a few moments. Uh, we've already spent time on walking in the Spirit in this series, but what does it mean if you live in the Spirit? Again, this speaks of salvation and the gift of the Spirit that we receive through regeneration. And and you'll notice, and by the way, there's so many passages, and you know this, but in 1 Corinthians 6, 17, there's no salvation apart from the Spirit of God. There is no salvation apart from the Spirit of God. This is what we need to settle in our hearts. It says, He that is joined unto the Lord is one Spirit. And then again, you can write down 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13, 
Because it says here, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. Now, to drink here is to partake or receive. Because the Spirit is is mentioned in reference in John 7 and other places to living water, to a fountain uh, of, of living water. And so we find that all who were saved and been baptized into the body of Christ, that they all have been made to drink into one Spirit. They have partook or received the Spirit of God at salvation. Now, why is this so important? John 3, verses 3 through 8, Jesus said, Except a man be born again, he cannot see or enter into the kingdom of God. Except a man be born of the Spirit. Born of the Spirit. And that's why in Titus 3, verses 5 through 7, speaks of the renewing of the Spirit, um, speaks of regeneration and it actually says renewing of the Holy Ghost. So we see clearly in the Scriptures that no one is saved without the Spirit of God. The Spirit is the gift. Um, it gives us, rather, the gift of salvation and of eternal life. Write down this one too. I'm going to read in Romans in just a moment. 2 Corinthians 13.5 as the Apostle Paul writes this letter and closes it, he said, Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith, prove your own selves, know you not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobate. The Christ dwells in us. Romans chapter 8, verses 8 and 9, he says, So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. It's like saying those that are lost. Verse 9, but you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. There's, that's clear. We don't really don't need any other passages. And as we come back here to Galatians, and coming back to Galatians now, he says... In verse 25, if we live in the Spirit, if we have partaken of the Spirit, if we are saved, if we have been truly born again, then, notice he says in the passage, let us also walk in the Spirit. And again, we've spent eight weeks dealing the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. So let us walk in the Spirit. What does that mean? In other words, if you live in the Spirit, if you're saved and the Spirit of God dwells in you, then let's walk according to that. Go back with me to verse 16 through verse 18. And let me read this. If you're, right, if you're taking notes, Galatians 6.16, we are told to walk according to this rule. That is the gospel. He said, For as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them and mercy and upon the Israel of God. Uh, Romans 6, 4, we were just reading a moment ago, it says that um, we are to walk in newness of life. That means we are to walk in the resurrection power that we have in Jesus Christ. 1 John 2, 6, speaking of how Christ walked, he says, that we ought to walk even as He walked. That is, walking in the Spirit. Now listen to this. Here's the key to the whole thing. Ezekiel 36, 24, dealing with the New Covenant. Listen to what it says. And there's two words that jump out at me in this passage. It says, I will put My Spirit within you and cause you to walk in My statutes. Two words. Cause and walk. He said, I will put my spirit in you and cause you to walk in my statutes. This is the only way that we can walk in the spirit and bear the fruit of the spirit. We must have the spirit of God in us and we must yield to it. So notice as we come here to verse uh, 16 through 18. This I say then, 
walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, you see here the two natures that dwell in the believer. He said, for the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would, but if you be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. You're not under its condemnation, its penalty. Again, I mentioned last week, as we closed out verse uh, 23, he says, against us there is no law. These things of the fruit of the Spirit are not condemned and are not contrary to the law. And so, what does it mean to walk in the Spirit? We know what it means to live in the Spirit. That is, we're saved by the grace of God. To walk in the Spirit speaks of the Christian life that we are to be governed and controlled by the Spirit of God. It's the opposite of verse 19, 20, and 21. It's the total opposite of walking in the works of the flesh. And again, we've spent weeks, this is going to be probably ten weeks uh, total from verse 16 down to verse 26. So let's come to the closing verse of this chapter. Now next Sunday night, we'll be taking a brief break from Galatians. We'll be observing the Lord's Supper and concentrating on that. But we'll get into chapter 6 the week after. But notice as we come to the close of this verse, and he says this, Let us not be desirous of vain glory provoking one another and envying one another. So, we close this with a solemn warning. As we've already found in verse 15 and in verses 19, 20, and 21. Notice in verse 15. In verse 15, and in the context of verse 15, if we do not walk in love... Verse 13 speaks of this liberty we have, but we're not to abuse this liberty, but by love serve one another. Verse 14, For all the laws fulfilled in one word, even this thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Verse 15 says, But, here's the warning, But if you bite and devour one another, and I doubt he's talking about literally biting with your teeth, he's talking about words that we use with one another, but if you bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. Verse 26 is a similar warning to what we find in verse 15. Now notice in verse 26, let us, now this is after saying, you that are saved have crucified the flesh, You that live in the Spirit, now walk in the Spirit. Verse 26, let us not be desirous of vain glory. And this vain glory provokes one another in a bad way. Now, there's a good way to provoke one another. (laughs) Hebrews 10, 24, 25 is a good way to provoke one another. But here, this is a bad way of provoking one another and envying one another. So what is vain glory? Well, turn with me, please, to Philippians. You can turn loose of our text, I think. Because we got the words vain glory and the words provoking one another and envying one another. So go into Philippians chapter 2. Now, we've read from Philippians 2 at least 10 or 15 times this year, and I hope next year we'll read from it 25 times because we need this passage. But let me take one verse, and then I'll read some other verses around it. But just let me take one verse to begin with. And let me read in verse 3. It said, Let nothing be done through strife. Now, there's the provoking and and the uh, envying. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. Vain glory. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. So, this vice 
of vain glory is to be avoided at all costs. It is a danger that is common to all men and women, and it is a work of the flesh. It is the opposite in our text now, reading verse 3, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. The opposite of that is that we are to walk in lowliness of mind and esteeming others better than ourselves. Now, why does this have to be repeated over and over and over again? Because of the prideful, sinful nature of man and woman. When I say man, I'm including all. So we find here a vain glory. What is this vain glory? We see it all around us. See it sometimes in the church. It is that boasting or vaunting ourselves to be superior to others. It is a self-exaltation, the desire to have honor, the, it is the, the, that pride of who we are or what we have. Vain glory, exalting ourselves above others. Now, now let's read the text now. And I'm going to give you two other passages. One is 2 Corinthians 12, 7. I'm not going to ask you to turn there. I'm just going to give that to you. Well, the Apostle Paul uh, says in that passage, he said, Lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelation, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Vain glory is to be exalted above measure. Another thing is, you see, the flesh, the old man, loves to show out. And it doesn't matter whether it's in the religious arena or in the world. Saved or lost, the the flesh just loves to show off. And listen to this passage. A passage that's dealing with prayer, it's giving with almsgiving, Prayer and fasting. Now we know all these are biblical doctrines. They should be done. There's nothing wrong with praying in private or public or giving in private or public. But listen to this. I'm reading three verses from Matthew 6. Verse 2, it says, When therefore, let me start over, Therefore when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues, and in the streets, that they may have glory of men, verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Now we come to prayer in verse 5. He says, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corner of the streets, that they may be seen of men, verily I say unto you, they have their reward. And then in verse 16, fasting. And moreover, when thou when you fast, be not as the hypocrites of sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear to men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Vain glory. It's a vice. It's a sin. It is something that is common among all of us. It is a work of the flesh. It is the opposite of lowliness of man, mind and esteeming others better than ourselves. That's got to be worked on. And it can only be done in the Spirit. Filled with the Spirit. Walking in the Spirit. Being led of the Spirit. Now what vainglory does, it provokes one another in a bad way and the envying of one another. And I actually wrote this little statement down. The ambition of vainglory is usually attended with envy and contentions, the very opposite of harmony. So if we went back to Galatians 5.15, verses 19, 20, and 21, we see the total opposite of harmony. In one writer, he says, He who aspires to the highest rank must of necessity Envy all others. Think about that. Those who aspire to be great and of a high rank 
They must of necessity envy others that may take their place. Another writer said, this is a very instructive verse because it shows our conduct to others is determined by our opinion of ourselves. When we're lifted up in our own mind, very easy to be rude and hateful to other people and treat them wrong. When we think highly of ourselves. But when we think lowly of ourselves and we exalt others, then we're walking as our Savior Jesus Christ did upon this earth. Now let me close with our text. And what is vainglory again? It is the boasting and vaunting ourselves to be superior to others, self-exaltation, the desire of honor, prideful of who we are and what we have. This must be worked upon. Because pride is one of the major things that all of us, whether young or old, deal with. Some of us may never be tempted to the bottle, to the cigarette, or to drugs, or anything like that. Some of us may not even be tempted in many other areas, but the pride that's inside of man to exalt himself, to be superior, to always outdo somebody else, always con- competing with somebody else, it causes contention and envy. It's just a fact. It don't matter where it's in a family or whether it's in a church or whether it's in a nation. It will bring disharmony among the home, the church, or the nation. Now let me read from verses 1 through verse 8 and we'll close. And I challenge you, church, to take your Bible, if you don't believe it's a sin, to mark in it, and highlight certain words down through here and let them, every time you open this page, jump out at you and grab a hold of you. Watch as we read this. Verse 1. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye may be like-minded. To be like-minded as Christ and as Paul. To be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal to God, but made of himself of no reputation. Underline that. Highlight that. And took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. Highlight it. We read this last week, by the way, and read it a couple of weeks before that. And became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Well, we could spend the rest of our Christian life just working on these eight verses if we didn't have any more Scripture to walk as our Savior walked and not walk in vain glory, which is a work of the flesh. Would you stand with me? Heavenly Father, we thank Thee this evening for this day that You've given us in Thy house with Thy people. And Lord, I pray today that's what been spoken this morning and tonight is according to Your Word and the leading of the Spirit. And I pray, Lord, that You would burn these truths in our hearts. Lord, help us not forget them when we're walking by the wayside, when we're working, when we're driving, that these things would come to our mind, that we would think about them. Lord, this is what You would have us to be that we would walk in the Spirit and bear the fruit of the Spirit and be led of the Spirit and not produce the works of the flesh. For it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.